Good morning. Um, I, I'm giving this presentation to start a discussion. I'm not giving this presentation because um, I actually have a lot of knowledge. As a matter of fact, I have only a little knowledge. The other reason that I'm giving this talk is that I was recently appointed to the Nutrient Criteria Working Group in my state to come up with numeric standards for the water resources in North Carolina. And as I've been thinking about this job, I've also been thinking about tying it back to the phosphorus index. Um, and so when I originally put this title together, um, I thought I knew where I was going, but as the presentation came together, I decided that it needed to be re renamed to how do we match phosphorus loss assessments with water quality outcomes. So I've alluded to this already. In the South, we've been working to compare phosphorus indices for a very long time. We found with the same data that they're, they're not highly comparable across states. Um, and furthermore, when we looked into why they weren't comparable, um, there are any number of reasons. Andrew already alluded to some of them. We're not always dealing with the same soil series, et cetera. And I just wanted to give you an idea of the difference in phosphorus indices across the South without going into a lot of detail. Um, so uh, Pete referred to component phosphorus indices that actually calculate losses in pounds of phosphorus per acre per year, surface runoff, um, soluble runoff, the runoff from the actual phosphorus that you put on the field. And a few of them can also contain leaching losses. So for instance, in North Carolina, we have a component phosphorus index that has a leaching loss. And at the end of the day, we're in pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. So there's also these um, component ones in Arkansas. Kentucky recently changed theirs to a component. Georgia's is a component. But in the rest of the states in the South, it was a more traditional phosphorus index that followed with modifications Jerry LeMunyon's um, original phosphorus index. So that just is setting the stage a little bit. Now, I'm doing this work in conjunction with these um, NRCS CIG projects. And I've already talked about uh, one of the objectives, which was finding the data sets. And then one of the things we want to do is compare our phosphorus indices back to the water quality data. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that objective. We've already started doing that. But I want to take this one step further and talk about how do we go from comparing, how do we determine what the water quality data is relative to the nutrient criteria standards that are starting to be set in many of our states. And that's where I get confused, and that's where um, I think we need a lot of discussion. So I've already shown you the locations of the data set that we have. These are the data that we're dealing with. I wasn't sure how many of you that were in the last session were in this session. So a few of these slides are repetitive. And again, four, four data pieces from Texas and four from Oklahoma. And when you look at the um, information that we've captured, again, we have pretty diverse agroecosystems within the southern region, which is pretty diverse. All right, we took the land use data from these different sites for the data that we have, and we ran them through each of our phosphorus indices. And Andrew already showed this. Um, sometime I'm gonna find out how he makes such pretty slides. Your slides are always much prettier. But um, for the purposes of this talk, let me walk you through what we did here. And then I, I wanna go back to that water quality standard. So these are data from Arkansas where he looked at different ways of applying litter, broadcasting, injecting it, a rotational grazing system, a continuous grazing system, and hay. And he measured the total phosphorus runoff, and we translated it to kilos per hectare. And you can see that the range was from about 2 to uh, a low of about 0.25 kilos per hectare per year. So then the question is, what does that loss of phosphorus mean relative to water quality? Now, I don't know how many of you are conversant with the NRCS 590 standard, the first one that came out when they were revising it in 2009. But in that version, 
NRCS put these ratings. And what they said was that if you, if you were from zero to 2.2 kilos per hectare per year, or two pounds per acre per year, you had a low phosphorus rating. 2.2 to 5.6 was medium, and above 5.6 you were high. So what I've done is I've taken the um, phosphorus loss that was measured, I made a corresponding translation to the phosphorus loss rating. So for Arkansas, all of the phosphorus loss is low. Then you can look across the states. Again, the same information was fed into all the state P indices. And for the most part, many of the states agree on the phosphorus index rating of low. Some of them were high, some medium. But for the most part, not only did they correspond with each other, but they corresponded to the NRCS rating. Now remember for places like Oklahoma and Kentucky and Arkansas, we actually calculate pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. But then we all translate that loss, that numeric loss, into a phosphorus index rating. We do it for different reasons. In North Carolina, we do it because we don't want anyone to ever assume that our phosphorus loss from our phosphorus index is real, you know, real. So um, anyway, uh, this is what the data look like. Now, the next thing I want to talk about briefly is the, this is the same exercise, but this is with North Carolina data. And it's really not so important that you look at the phosphorus loss index ratings relative to NRCS or relative to each other. But the thing that I want to talk about, and this is the conversation that um, uh, I think we need to be having, is that when you look at the Arkansas data, the ratio of soluble to total P is about 75 to almost 100%. For the North Carolina data, these ratios are much, much smaller. Okay, so how important is soluble P to these systems? Because regardless, we're almost always measuring for water quality purposes, total P. All right, this talk is gonna switch gears big time here. Um, and this is really what I, where I wanna go with this talk. These are EPA ecoregions as designated by, um, I just said that, EPA. So EPA uh, put forth a nutrient criteria, phosphorus criteria for those eco-regions initially quite a while back. And um, I, I'm sure all of you can think in um, micrograms per liter, but I cannot. So I translated their standards into, um, well, not their criteria, into total phosphorus in milligrams per liter. For lakes and reservoirs, which are going to be more sensitive to phosphorus because it accumulates, the uh, least amount of phosphorus allowed is 0 0.008 milligrams per liter, and the highest ecoregion um, amount of phosphorus is 0 0.4. When you get to rivers and streams, a little bit more phosphorus is allowed. So here the minimum um, that they set, I believe, is 0 0.3 and the maximum is about 0 0.8. But at no point are, do you see any phosphorus that's at 0 0.1 milligrams per liter, and, and that's fairly important um, in the next couple of slides. So how many of you are engaged in st setting state nutrient criteria for your water resources? A few of you. How many of you have been to talks from the state of Florida where they've described the pain and suffering they went through. <laughs> okay, this is not an easy process, but NR, um, US EPA is requiring every state to set nutrient criteria. Um, some states, like Florida, unfortunately, it was first out of the box, so it, it kind of went through a very serious learning process. This map shows uh, where different states are. A lot of states haven't even started. The dark, deep purple is that those states are pretty well there. But I just want to show you some of the numbers that the states that have set their nutrient criteria are looking at relative to the development of phosphorus. So this is from Wisconsin. These are lakes and reservoirs. Um, the thing that I find interesting about the slide is a, a couple different things. 
First of all, it's specific water resources. For instance, open and nearshore waters to Lake Michigan, open and wa nearshore waters of Lake S Superior. One of them has um, a cap of 0 0.005 and the other has a cap of 0 0.007. So you have different phosphorus standards um, within different lakes and reservoirs in uh, Wisconsin. And this is going to have implications. I'm going to try and keep tying this back to phosphorus indices. When we're talking about um, the running phosphorus indices on our different landscapes and what that means. And there, because in some states like Alabama, it's important for them to know what the water, what the sensitivity is of the water resource that the field's water is draining into. In North Carolina, we said, we're just stupid soil scientists and agronomists. We don't have that level of knowledge. So we're just going to tell them what we think, and then they're going to have to translate that back to the water resource. But I think we're going to have to start thinking about that as these nutrient criteria are set. Wisconsin, now remember when I showed you the streams and lakes for overall ecoregions, not in any instance was there a 0 0.1 milligram per liter. And and yet Wisconsin is setting all of their streams, specific streams, to 0 0.1, except for a street, the streams that aren't listed. And that has um, a, a rating that's a little bit lower. So again, this is an order of magnitude higher than the original EPA uh, ecoregion for streams and rivers. All right, and then Florida estuaries, there are like 50, 60 different estuaries that have different numbers, and thankfully for you all, I'm just showing you a few. But depending on the estuary, again, it harkens back to different phosphorus levels. Um, in Blackburn Bay, you can have 0.2 milligrams per liter. In the lower keys, you're limited to 0 0.008, tiny, tiny amounts of phosphorus. Okay. So. This is a slide from some work we're doing in North Carolina in Jordan Lake. It's a nutrient-paired lake. Don't look at the numbers. They don't matter. This, it's just a picture for you all to look at. And the question is, is um, when these standards get set in North Carolina, I'm sure we'll have a standard for Jordan Lake. We get that. But then are we going to have standards for the rivers and streams? Are they going to vary depending on the sub-watershed? And my concern is how we translate from our phosphorus index run at the field in this watershed to those standards. So where are we measuring the phosphorus? Are we measuring total P or soluble P? Are we reporting concentration or load? In North Carolina's P in component P index, we can come up with a, a concentration, but I'm not sure even that all the um, P component P indices can come up with concentrations, and certainly the true indexes won't be able to come up with concentrations. So um, I want to thank Andrew for these, these couple of slides um, and the conversations we had a couple days ago. Um, one of the things that um, I think, and through some of Pete's work and other people's work, is um, We've always been measuring total P, thinking that will be the indicator. But do we need to start measuring dissolved phosphorus? So these are from Lake Erie. I'm sure everyone in the room knows they had a terrible bloom last year. It's attributed to phosphorus. And most of that phosphorus is coming from agricultural sources. Um, and over there, there's this amazing data set out of Heidelberg College. And over about a 40-year period, the concentration of total P in Sandusky is 0 0.4. Now, the reason I, I want to show that concentration is that that's significantly higher than what you saw for Wisconsin setting its um, criteria. And it's very, uh, it's very much over the period of 40 years. Not much has changed. Whereas in the Mamami, it's gone down, but it's gone down from 0 0.6 to 0 0.4. So we have fairly high concentrations already go, going in. And Andrew's going to talk about legacy effects um, later on. And then for dissolved feet, phosphorus, um, people were really excited because they saw the trends going down. And then, lo and behold, the trends started going up again. And um, uh, Dr. Smith just had a great uh, article in Journal of Soil and Water Conservation with a bunch of other folks talking about all the different contributors of phosphorus in that particular watershed and changes in management practices 
may that may that may have caused the decrease and then the increase. And then uh, this is some work by Helen Jarvie, who I think is absolutely brilliant. She reanalyzed the data and she looked at the trends of total P versus flow in this kind of a period where soluble P was going down, and there was you know oh well I have plenty of time, <laughs> thanks. Uh, there was great relationship, and then she reanalyzed it after 2002 when soluble P started going up, and there's greater dissolved phosphorus loads um, generated relative to flow than before. And the question is, is it the soluble phosphorus loads that are triggering, triggering the blooms? Um, and do we need to be also looking at soluble phosphorus? And then the last thing I want to talk about is, I mean, we've all, thankfully, due to much work, done by a number of people in this room, started understanding that we have a lot of phosphorus loss, not only through tile drains, this is um, some work by um, Dr. King and um, Dr. Smith, but, um, um, and, and some of that uh, phosphorus loss in tile drains is total P, some of it's soluble P. Um, Peter showed a slide in the part of the uh, area where he works where a lot of the phosphorus is moving through subsurface flow. But in Ohio, what I find interesting is the, the loss that they're looking at is one pound of phosphorus per acre per year. And that may be enough to be triggering these blooms. And so that takes me back to this slide where NRCS set these limits for low, medium, and high. Um, and I have a couple questions about this. Um, are these numbers really useful, what is low loss, what is medium loss, what is high loss, how do we tie it back to the water resource, and how do we differentiate total phosphorus and soluble phosphorus in that watershed? And the reason I'm showing you data from Oklahoma is that when we looked at the ratio of soluble to total P, it ranged from 3 to 100 percent. So in, in one case it was all soluble P, in another case it was almost none. And this may have a difference in the reactivity of the phosphorus in the water resource. So as I've been thinking about how we're going to match our phosphorus index tools, now let's assume that we didn't even have the discussion we had the last session, and our phosphorus indices worked perfectly, I'm still really concerned about how we're going to, oh, how we're going to tie these into nutrient standards. So first of all, it's going to take a lot of us a long time. So I'm going to be retired by the time we really have to tackle this, but I think we need to put it on the table. Um, and since we have so many water resources with unique uh, phosphorus criteria, how are we going to relate that back to our phosphorus indices? What are we going to measure? Where are we going to measure it? And um, concentration is not the entire story, but load is not the entire story. And last but not least, I think the work from Ohio is critically important in that it's showing really small losses can have large consequences. Um, and so I think we've got a lot of things to think through over and beyond our phosphorus tools.